welcome everybody. Now for this afternoon, I'm on the wrong page. Whoops, I'm thoroughly on the wrong page, I apologise. I do apologise, but I won't waste any, any more of your time. So I would like everybody to make Christopher feel welcome. Thank you. University of New South Wales. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about... Was that, was that not on before? Okay. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about Ceph and DRBD, uh, two distributed storage systems. I'm going to be comparing them, talking about what I liked and didn't like, uh, what their strengths and weaknesses are. So at Trustworthy Systems, uh, we provide networked home directories to our members. You can log into any machine on the network and you'll see the same home directory with all the changes you've made to it. The way we accomplish that is using a combination of something called DRBD and NFS. So the file system that those home directories are in has to be stored somewhere. Uh, DRBD handles that task, and it's better if that file system can be stored in multiple places at once. Uh, we have DRBD does the work of storing the file system on multiple servers at a time and keeping it consistent across those different servers. And then we use NFS, the network file system protocol, to export uh, those home directories over the network so they can be mounted on whatever machine someone's using. So let's do some more detail on that. DRBD stands for Distributed Replicated Block Device. A block device is what DRBD is designed to work on. It deals in block devices. Replicated means that the contents of that block device are going to be copied identically to several places. Distributed means that that copying is happening to several machines on a network. Uh, so multiple machines each have a block device. Those block devices on separate machines have the same content, and DRBD handles making sure that that stays the same. Uh, then we mount that file system on one of the machines and use NFS to export it. So this setup uh, works pretty well, but it does have a couple of weaknesses. One of them is that NFS and DRBD don't know about each other. DRBD has no idea that the block device it's replicating is actually being served over the network onto other machines higher up. NFS doesn't know that this file system it's exporting is actually replicated across multiple physical servers. That means if you ever want to change the configuration here, there's more work you've got to do. There are more places you have to make the changes. Also, because they don't know about each other, um, a DRBD resource can only be in primary mode on one or two hosts at a time. Primary mode is the mode where you're allowed to read and write the data on that block device. So the easiest way to deal with that is usually put the DRBD resource in primary mode on only one of the servers and leave it in secondary on the others so it can't be read from or written to on the other servers, and then run your NFS daemon that's doing the exports on the same server where the resource is primary. If that server goes down, however, that means that DRBD is not going to automatically put the resource up into primary mode on another server. You're not going to get an NFS daemon automatically spinning up on another server. And even if they did do that, uh, there's no guarantee that their efforts to recover would work together, because again, they don't know about each other. There are tools you can use to try to automate this thing and get them to work together, but that's also adding an extra layer of complexity on top. Another issue with this setup is DRBD doesn't have the greatest conflict resolution support. Um, if two servers end up concluding that the contents of the block device should be different if they disagree, often you end up having to just manually issue the command to resynchronize the data on the device, and that can take hours to happen. Um, so we've been thinking about alternatives to how we store our home directories, and an option that we landed on is called Ceph. 
Ceph is a distributed storage system which is designed to be able to scale to really large deployments. Um, it supports three different ways of mounting file systems over the network, and it dynamically redistributes where the data is stored on different hosts. It's really intended to be an all-in-one solution. And I like that. I think it's, it's nice to have a system where the components are designed to know about each other and work together. But it's also a bit more complex than DRBD is. So to determine whether or not this would actually be a good choice to replace our existing NFS DRBD setup, I created test deployments of each of these two structures so that I could compare them. First point of comparison we come to, how easy are these things to set up from scratch? How much work does it take to get DRBD and NFS going? How much work does it take to get Ceph going? DRBD has a big advantage here. DRBD is a fairly simple technology. There's not that many moving parts to it. Um, DRBD consists of two main components. There is some user space software that you use to configure the resource and give it instructions. And there is a kernel module which does most of the work of replicating the data and communicating with other servers. The steps for getting the NFS DRBD deployment going will look something like this. First, you need to download the user space configuration software and you need to load the kernel module. You then have to write a configuration file to describe what your resource is going to look like and you start it running. You need to decide where you're going to have the resource in primary mode. Um, mount, and then you can create a file system on the resource and mount the thing. And once it's mounted on one of your servers, you can start up an NFS daemon and tell NFS, here's the file system, export this thing over the network. When I was setting this up, uh, the NFS part was pretty straightforward. I didn't come into any problems there. Setting up a DRBD resource had a couple more steps to it. It was mostly not much of a problem. DRBD's parent company, Linbit, provides a user manual which tells you just about everything you need to know to get DRBD going. There was one substantial problem I ran into with DRBD setup, and that was that the kernel module and the user space software can be on different versions. I wanted to be using DRBD version 9 because that allows replication to three or more hosts at a time. The RBD version 8 and before can only replicate between two hosts. Now, the latest Debian packages for the user space software were on the RBD version 9, but the version 9 kernel module hasn't been integrated into the upstream Linux kernel yet. So for a while, I was trying to send commands to a kernel module and it didn't understand, and the format of the configuration file changed a bit with the versions as well. So it had no idea what I was telling it to do. Fortunately, that wasn't too hard to solve. Uh, Linbit also provides source code for the kernel module, so I could just download, compile the version 9 kernel module and load that. And from that point, DRBD pretty much worked. So on to Ceph. Ceph has a lot more moving parts than DRBD does. A Ceph cluster is made up of many different demons all working together and doing different tasks. These are the four most prominent kinds of Ceph daemons. Uh, there are the object storage daemons, or OSDs. Each OSD is responsible for managing one unit of storage, such as one hard disk, one drive. Uh, there are monitors. Their job is to make sure that all the other daemons are performing their tasks correctly and to track where the data is. Uh, manager daemons watch the cluster's health and performance. And metadata servers store metadata for the file systems that your Ceph cluster is managing to make them easier and faster to access. But these four are just the four most prominent ones. There are a bunch of other daemons as well in a Ceph cluster. Ceph has so many moving parts to it that it comes with its own uh, configuration utility called Ceph ADM to help you set up the cluster. If you're using Ceph ADM, then making a Ceph cluster looks something like this. One, you tell Ceph ADM to bootstrap the cluster, which means it's going to create a single monitor, a single manager, and some configuration and authentication information. That bootstrapping happens on one machine. You then have to connect other hosts up to it so that the cluster can start spreading. Third, you take all the devices you want to actually use for storing things and create an OSD on top of each of them. 
then you tell the Ceph cluster to create a file system, and it'll use those OSDs to get the storage it needs to put that file system on. Finally, uh, a client needs to be authenticated to the Ceph cluster before it's allowed to access the cluster and mount the file systems that are in it. Now, Ceph has documentation, and quite a lot of it. Uh, there is a documentation website. Uh, you can also look at man pages on the Ceph commands, and you can often run a Ceph command and stick .h on the end, and it'll show you what are the further ways you can extend this command. One pretty substantial challenge I've run into with understanding Ceph is it doesn't feel like any of these three sources are really comprehensive. I found things in each of them that don't seem to appear in the others. You kind of have to check all three to be sure that you've seen what your options are. And even then, you can come across a situation where you've got, say, two different commands that seem like they're supposed to do the same thing. But in fact, they might not. Ceph's documentation is good at giving a high-level overview of how a cluster works. Uh, the four key types of Ceph daemons I listed earlier, that's an example of information that is very easy to get out of Ceph's documentation. There are also a lot of instances in the documentation where you are told, in order to perform this action, run this command. Low-level instructions. But I find the documentation kind of struggles with giving mid-level explanations of what are my options, why would I want to do this versus the other? What does this really mean? Um, for instance, step three of setting up a Ceph cluster was create OSDs. These are two different commands. Both of these commands appear on Ceph's documentation website on different pages. Both of these commands will create an OSD for you in your cluster on top of a particular logical volume. Something that the documentation does not make clear is that these two commands are different in a significant way. The first command will create that OSD under the management of Ceph ADM, the tool which is explicitly designed to help you with deploying all the daemons in a Ceph cluster. The second command will not create the OSD under the management of Ceph ADM. Ceph ADM will be able to detect that an OSD is there, but won't be able to do anything to it until you explicitly adopt it. This is the sort of thing that you can run into when you're trying to understand what's going on inside Ceph's documentation. So, on the simplicity of setup, DRBD is definitely further ahead than Ceph. That's to be expected, though. DRBD is a simpler tool. It does not do as much. It does not support as many options. It's not surprising that it's less work to set the thing up. So what about features? What do these tools support? How easy are they to use? What options can they give us? Well, I just mentioned DRBD is a pretty simple technology. All it's really doing is replicating the data on this block device. DRBD doesn't have any higher level options on top of that. It can't, for instance, put a file system on the block device. It can't do any kind of cluster awareness for you. You have to create your own file system on top of the block device um, once you have DRBD replicating the thing. You can, from the command line, view the status of your DRBD resource. You can see where is it primary, where is it secondary, uh, where is it up to date. Uh, this was taken while a DRBD resource was synchronizing to um, the two other servers. But that's about all the information you can get. There's just not that much high-level stuff going on in the operations DRBD is performing. In contrast, Ceph's feature set is probably my favorite part of it. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Ceph dynamically redistributes data. Uh, it's not like DRBD, which is essentially copying the exact contents of this block device onto another block device on another server. Ceph will actually decide this OSD is this size, this OSD is this size, I'm going to give this one more data because it can hold more. Um, it will move where the data is replicated around based on what the storage options are. So it's really quite easy to add and remove OSDs to your cluster as you get more storage or as you lose storage options. If you have bootstrapped your Ceph cluster using Ceph ADM, then it will come with a graphical dashboard that you can reach over the web. I mentioned that Ceph manages 
watch the cluster's health and performance. You can see a lot of that information here. You can also perform a lot of the setup tasks for a Ceph cluster from this dashboard. You can add hosts to your cluster from here. You can deploy services from here. You are supposed to be able to create OSDs from here, too. I haven't managed it because of an issue to do with how Ceph detects whether a device is empty or not. One of my favorite things about Ceph, uh, from a system administrator perspective, is how automatic it is. I've had times when I have taken down one of the hosts in a Ceph cluster, and then I've brought the host back up and rejoined it, and initially, the cluster status up in the top left will say, health warning, bad data. But in a few minutes, without me having to issue any commands, Ceph will have cleaned up the problem, and the cluster will be back to full health again. Uh, Ceph is intentionally designed to be self-healing, so that it will find and try to fix problems for you. When that same kind of thing happens in DRBD, if I take a host down and bring it back up and try to reconnect it into the cluster, I will often need to tell it to resynchronize the data on the drive. And that can take hours to happen. So, so far I've been talking about qualitative things. How do these tools feel? What sort of options do I have on them? Let's get some numbers involved. How do they perform? I mentioned there are three different ways you can mount a Ceph file system over the network. Uh, there is a kernel driver you can use for mounting Ceph file systems. Uh, you can mount them in user space with Fuse. And you can export a Ceph file system over NFS, similar to what we were doing with DRBD, although it's all handled inside Ceph. So when we include DRBD, that's four different ways we can mount a file system to run tests on. Uh, for testing performance, I had three main strategies. Uh, the first was a program called Postmark. The way Postmark works is it creates a couple of hundred files, and then it performs creates and deletes and reads on those files. It completes a set total workload and then finishes. The faster you can get that workload done, the better your file system is performing. NFS Bench uh, forks itself to create several processes. Each process creates one file, and that process is the only one that's going to work on that file. Um, the process, each process will then open its file, write data into the file, close the file, repeat that many times over. Again, there is a set total workload. The sooner you can get through that workload, the better your file system is performing. And the last thing I did, I took the NFS Bench program and I modified it so that rather than completing a set workload, it would just run continuously for about 10 minutes. And then I mounted a file system on several different clients at a time and ran that long-running NFS bench program on all of them at once. And I watched CPU usage on the server and client machines while that was happening. Actually, no, I'm going to stay on that slide for now. So if you don't really understand a system well, there are a lot of ways you can end up measuring the wrong thing. Especially with something like this distributed file systems, there are a lot of components that go into the end results you get when you try to test their performance. You've got to think about what are the capabilities of the clients? What kind of network connection do the clients have to the servers? What are the capabilities of the servers? How are the servers talking to each other? What sort of algorithms are they using to decide where the data ends up? If you don't really know what you're doing, it's easy to end up measuring the performance of some bizarre configuration that you shouldn't be using in production anyway. That happened to me several times over. First, I originally created my Ceph OSDs so that they were storing all of their data on hard disks. Well, the Ceph documentation recommends that if you can, you should put the write ahead log for the OSD on something faster so that you don't have to wait for the, hard, for the slower hard disk as often. When I made that change, I then had a look at NFS Bench. I noticed NFS Bench was using the sync system call. I tried running it using the fsync system call instead. Both of those uh, system calls are basically designed to commit the changes to the underlying file system or storage. And I saw a huge difference in performance, and I thought, OK, Ceph is just much better optimized for fsync. Nope, turns out the difference is fsync commits one file at a time, sync commits the entire file system every time you call it. 
It was the difference between each process committing its own file and each process committing every file. It, Ceph was just doing quadratically less work because I changed which system call I was using. <laughs> and then when I was running the CPU uh, status, the CPU usage uh, experiments, there were some cases where I found that the clients were spending almost 100% of their time waiting for I.O. to happen, but the servers were virtually completely idle. Somehow the clients were hitting a huge bottleneck and the servers had nothing to do. Uh, turns out that was because the switch that was connecting the clients to the servers just couldn't keep up with all the traffic. The problem was nothing to do with Ceph or DRBD. The problem was to do with the network wasn't fast enough. So having been through those experiences, uh, here are the results I ended up with on my last run of these tests. So this is results for postmark. On the y-axis, we've got how long the experiment took to run. Remember, a faster completion is better. Um, on the bottom, on the horizontal, we've got how big the experiments were. The yellow bar is a Ceph file system mounted using NFS. Green is Ceph file system mounted using the kernel driver. Blue is Ceph mounted using Fuse. And red is DRBD mounted over NFS. I'm going to be maintaining that color scheme for the next couple slides. So under postmark, we're seeing the Ceph kernel is doing quite well for itself. Uh, DRBD and Ceph over NFS are actually doing extremely similarly. Uh, I was hoping coming into this that Ceph would just visibly outperform DRBD, but to be doing quite similarly is still pretty good when you consider that Ceph is rather more complex and does a lot more for you. Ceph Fuse, however, is having some issues. I actually had to cut off the top of this graph so that we could see what was going on with the other mount types. <laughs> Ceph user is not happy. Um, the Ceph kernel driver and Ceph over NFS are the ones we're particularly interested in. Uh, the Ceph kernel driver seems to be performing very well. And Ceph over NFS uh, is useful because the tools that allow you to do the Ceph-specific file system mounts are not available on every platform. Uh, we want to be exporting over NFS where we can because that's something we know virtually every machine is going to be able to accept. So it's good to see that Ceph is not doing worse than DRBD over NFS. Now, under NFS Bench, NFS Bench has a lot more parameters than Postmark does for varying the size of an experiment. Uh, again, on the y-axis, we've got how long the experiment took. Shorter is better. Uh, this is specifically each process was opening and writing into its file 400 times. And on the bottom, we've got how many blocks of data were written and the minimum size of the file it was getting written into. Kind of interesting thing here that I noticed, the number of blocks written in the minimum file size aren't really changing anything. We're getting pretty similar um, levels of performance as we vary those. The only parameter that I found visibly made a difference with NFS Bench was the number of opens. When I doubled the number of opens, the time it took to complete the experiment was a lot longer. That's not remotely surprising, though. The number of opens is roughly the total workload that you've got to do. Uh, so if you double it, you can expect a roughly double uh, duration on how long it takes to get the experiment done. OK, so for the CPU usage experiment, remember the way this works is I've got 10 client machines. Uh, the file system is mounted on all 10 at once. And then I'm running NFS bench on each of those machines all at the same time and watching the CPU usage on the clients and on the server. Uh, NFS Bench, incidentally, I was running it so that it would fork itself to make four worker processes for each instance of NFS Bench, because the machines I was running on had four CPUs. So all the CPUs have things to do, but they're not overloaded with loads of tasks. So here we have, when mounted using Ceph Fuse, what percentage of total CPU time was spent waiting for I.O.? Uh, so the y-axis is percentages. Notice it's not going up to 100%. I had to shrink it so that we could see what was going on here. Not much I.O. is happening. This is, these are pretty small numbers, really. There are a lot of lines on this graph because I have 10 clients plus three servers. Uh, the black and the gray lines are the servers. All the colored lines are clients. I'm, again, going to be keeping that convention for the rest of these graphs. Uh, along the bottom is just... As the experiment progressed, what time it was, the experiment is designed to run for about 10 minutes. 
so we're seeing these experiments between 600 700 seconds. Um, so yeah, not very much I/O is happening here. We can see one of the client, one of the servers, the light gray, is getting a little more I/O than the others, but the numbers are so small that's that's not really a big conclusion. Um, for idle time, how, what percentage of time did the CPU spend idle? We can see the black and the grays are below the colors. The servers are spending a little less time idle. That's not really weird. The servers are having to service everything from all the clients. Each client is only doing its own work. Now, under the Ceph kernel driver, we have a much more interesting picture. Uh, the clients are spending a whole lot of time on IO wait under the Ceph kernel driver. Something about the kernel driver is really inefficient in its usage of the CPU, um, or at least in the, the time it takes for IO to happen. The servers, however, are not getting very, are not having to do much I/O. It's a little hard to see because there's so many colors going everywhere. But if you look at the bottom, you can see the gray lines and the black line are still down the bottom. Uh, the servers are not having a hard time. It's the clients that are having to wait a lot. Uh, idle time looks like it's just about a mirror of the I/O wait time. Again, the servers are up the top. They are mostly idle. The clients are the ones who are spending big chunks of time not idle. But presumably, that's mostly I.O. wait. The DRBD mounted over NFS looks a lot more consistent than the kernel driver does. So DRBD, it's holding at around 50-ish percent of CPU time is waiting for I.O. It's a lot, but it's not going everywhere. It's pretty predictably the same thing. You can see one of the servers here is spending a lot more time on I.O. than the others. If you remember, the way DRBD works, we can only have it in primary mode on one server at a time. So only one of the servers is actually exporting over NFS. That's the one that's getting the, the longer I.O. wait times than the other two servers. That's why one of the servers is getting a higher I.O. wait than the others. And again, idle time looks like it's pretty much a mirror image. Uh, I, I did also record things like the percentage of CPU time spent on user space, spent in kernel space, as opposed to idle and I.O. and so forth. But those numbers were so consistently small across everything, I didn't bother showing them. It's the I.O. and the idle time where we get interesting looking graphs. And for Ceph mounted over NFS, interestingly, like DRBD mounted over NFS, it's holding around the sort of 50% region. It's just more jagged. Ceph seems like it's a bit less consistent in the amount, in the time spent on IO weight than DRBD is. But it is holding around the same area. And I think that commonality is related to the fact that both of these are exporting over NFS. Uh, the idle time, again, basically a mirror of the IO weight time. So, uh, what do I think of these things in the end? Well, DRBD is definitely simpler to form your mental model of. Uh, if you need to spend time understanding how something works before you can start using it, DRBD is going to take you less time to understand what the pieces are and how they fit together. Uh, there aren't as many moving parts. It's going to probably be easier to set up from scratch. You may need to compile the kernel module if you want DRBD version 9, but that's the most major snag you're likely to run into. Of course, that simplicity comes at the expense of DRBD does not do nearly as much. Uh, it will replicate the contents of this block device, but it has a hard time recovering from conflicts, and it doesn't really support any additional features on top of that. Ceph, much more automatic. It does a lot of things for you without you even having to issue commands. Uh, it is very capable of fixing up issues with um, the consistency of data, for instance. But it has a much more complex structure to making a Ceph cluster work. There's a lot of daemons that all need to exist and communicate with each other. For the most part, you don't need to actually set up all these daemons yourself. Uh, you might have noticed when I was talking about setting up a Ceph cluster from scratch, I didn't say anything about creating extra monitors or managers or metadata servers. You don't have to do that. Ceph ADM will spin those up as necessary when your cluster gets bigger. But you will need to, for instance, probably create your own OSDs. Ceph also probably needs your configuration. Um, in order to get the best out of it, you'll need to spend a bit of time changing the setup from what it is out of the box. Uh, like I had to 
realize, actually, just putting an OSD on top of a hard disk on its own is not getting the best out of an OSD. I should also give it a faster drive for its write ahead log. That sort of thing. So I think DRBD is going to be easier to start up with if you've got a, sort of, a small sort of deployment you're working with. Uh, DRBD might be a good idea. It's going to have less initial investment to get it going. But as the size of your deployment gets bigger, as the complexity of what you want to do gets higher, Ceph is going to become more and more and more valuable because it is so capable of dealing with different situations, different uh, machines with different storage options, and rebalancing and redistributing things as the capabilities that it's asked to deal with change. That's all I've got to say. Thank you, Christopher. Have we got any questions for him? Just a couple of implementation uh, questions around NFS. Um, first, do the NFS that it, that it exports from CEPs, is that just the normal Linux kernel NFS engine, or does it have its own NFS engine? And another question is, you mentioned exporting over NFS because of the clients would need it, as opposed to native connectivity to CEPs. Um, what clients are supported natively for CEPs? OK, so Ceph over NFS. Let's do that first. Um, the Ceph NFS export you set up inside the Ceph cluster. Uh, so there's a place you go. You can do this from the dashboard. You can say, I want an NFS export. And then Ceph will create some daemons that do that. Um, so Ceph does the NFS from inside the cluster. Um, as for what? platforms the Ceph is available on. I'm not sure what the full list is. Uh, I've been doing all this on Debian, so I know for a fact it works on Debian. Um, I know I'm pretty sure one of the, I don't believe, for instance, Ceph will work on Macs. Uh, that is, I don't believe you can, uh, you, you can mount things as a Ceph client on a Mac. And some of the people in our organization use Macs. So we need to be able to set things up so that that will still work. Um, Full list of what Ceph supports, I'm not sure. Uh, I've basically learned what I needed to get this going. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the original use case. I think you kind of actually answered it before that it's within your organization, um, uh, but you are on UNSW campus. Uh, and like, what are the clients that are accessing these uh, home directories running? Um, yeah, the use case and the clients that are actually using it. So the, the people who are accessing the home directories are members of trustworthy systems. We have, so we are attached to UNSW, but we have our own servers and we manage our own little infrastructure for our research group. Um, so yeah. Our home directories are not part of the general UNSW computer science and engineering department. Uh, and uh, because it seems the you know, if you want to spin up any sort of computer and have access to that home directory, what's the actual reason for that other than you know, if someone's using the same machine all the time, are there people in your organization using different machines? Or? Potentially, yes. Uh, in some cases, there might be. Um, someone's wanting to do some kind of tests on a particular machine, but that's not like their work, their work machine or their laptop that they bring in with them. There can be situations like that. And I found it is useful to have these home directories that mount on everything to move stuff around sometimes. Uh, yep. So I've got a question. Um, did you get to benchmark any metadata performance or metadata um, so in regards to, I'll give you a simple scenario, uh, a directory that has, say, a million files in it that might hit one OSD, or you have a very, very large file which lots of processes are hitting, which again could have an impact on metadata performance. Have you done any benchmarks like that? 
No, the, the tests I've done are the ones I've talked about here. Uh, hi, uh, I, I nowadays spend a lot more time on Ceph than more on the block side, but in my past web hosting life, I did a lot of uh, DRVD NFS in the late 2000s, and uh, we were using was well, then Heartbeat, now Pacemaker to do like the failover stuff. I was curious whether you were actually leveraging that and left it out, or whether you weren't leveraging that to handle the you know moving stuff around. And yeah, our current our current setup does not use Pacemaker. I've been working on redesigning our setup, and I'm using Pacemaker for that. Uh, but for our home directory's storage, I'm using Ceph because I like I like the self-healing. That, that's one of my favorite things about it. It fixes problems for you, <laughs> and when it does that, it does it. See, it, I found it seems to do it a lot faster than DRBD does as well. Thanks. So one thing that I've seen quite often with NFS mounts is uh, a lack of transport. Uh, encryption, so transit being plain text. Um, have you, like, how does Ceph compare in that regards to out of the box capabilities? I don't think Ceph does any encryption on the data it sends either. Um. Thank you. I noticed you talked about the networking side of it and how your switch was a bottleneck at one point. Have you then decided to leverage a separate switch for the Ceph clustering? So the switch that I was running those tests over is not a switch that's responsible for most of our running the, the, the main networks that everyone's working on. This switch was connecting to a set of machines that we generally use specifically for benchmarking things. Um, they're useful because they're all basically the same, and since we're using them for benchmarking, there's not other things going on on them at the same time. Uh, so that the switch that was causing the bottleneck there is not a switch that's really going to be coming into play in the day-to-day -day use of Ceph. Uh, although, of course, we have replaced that with a faster switch for the benchmarks I showed here so that we could get rid of the bottleneck. Anything else right now? Yeah, I'm going to have a little bit of time going into afternoon tea as well, and I'll take it will be around for the rest of the day. Yep. Lovely. In the meantime, thank you so much, Christopher. It's a little gift from us for you. Thank you for your time. Thank you.